In this video, we're going to continue chapter 10 and start into part 4, where we'll discuss group differences in intelligence. Now, this is quite the controversial topic. Researchers have long been interested in differences between different ethnic groups, people of different races, and even men and women. As long as they can divide people into different groups, people have been interested in figuring out differences in their abilities. Unfortunately, a lot of the findings where there are differences between groups has led to, at best, bitter debate about what it means, and at worst, the implementation of discriminatory, discriminatory practices. Knowledge of these differences has inspired stereotypes about certain groups of individuals and can even influence the self-identity of people within those groups. If you are an individual, or if you are part of a group, because you're always an individual, but if you are part of a group who has a stereotype of being overly intelligent, then you might think yourself intelligent. But that also works the other way, where if you're part of a group stereotyped as unintelligent, you then might think yourself unintelligent. So these stereotypes can have negative effects on individuals. So at the beginning of this video, I wanted to take some time to acknowledge that there are problematic applications of some of this knowledge. And when we start looking at differences between groups, it's caused a lot of problems in the past and is causing a lot of problems now. These aren't problems that are completely gone. But it's important to talk about the fact that these kinds of experiments or um, surveys of intelligence have been conducted and that we have this information. But we're also going to look at how some of these studies might be really biased and the results might not mean what we think they mean. But the whole point of this uh, chat at the very beginning here is just so that you keep in mind the purpose of this discussion. We're not trying to support stereotypes or draw conclusions about which group might be better than another group. The intent here is to evaluate which differences exist and why those differences might exist, whether that be an environmental influence, a genetic influence, or maybe even an artifact of the testing procedure itself. So on that note, let's start off by actually talking very, very briefly about heredity, the environment, and intelligence. I'm aware that genetics is a topic that's covered much more extensively in Psych 104, so we're only going to touch very briefly on that topic here. But Genetics do play an important role in intelligence. However, even though multiple, multiple experiments have shown a strong genetic component to intelligence, there is no intelligence gene. There is no one gene within our genome that is responsible for our intelligence. So we can think of it as our genetics basically give us a range in which our intelligence could fall. So if we have lots of good genes, then maybe we're going to end up being more intelligent. And maybe if we have some not so good genes, we're going to end up being less intelligent. But genes are not deterministic. They're not going to tell us exactly what our IQ is when we get older. They're just going to set a range in which our IQ might fall. A lot of our intelligence is actually drawn from our environment. So a quarter to a third of all of the variability in individuals' intelligence is attributed to their environmental factors. So our environment plays a massive role in whether or not we are more or less intelligent when we get older. To visualize this, we can think of a range so our genes say that we're going to fall somewhere between an IQ of 80 and 100. But if we're in a very poor environment, we don't have a lot of environmental enrichment, we might fall at the lower end of the range that our genes say we should be, 
if instead of a poor environment, maybe we're in an enriched environment. Maybe we have uh, the ability to attend a really good school. Maybe we have lots of toys and our parents read to us. Maybe we're going to end up on this upper end of the range set out by our genes. So our environment has the ability to shift how our genetic component is actually experienced in practice. And we can actually see the effect of this where children removed from deprived environments, basically non-enriched environments, can show an increase in IQ of up to 10 or 12 points. So children who were failing in school but then get moved to a better school or who have extra tutoring or extra training or access to those enriching resources can show an increase in IQ. So it's not just determined by our genetics, our environment plays a major role in intelligence as well. Now here is where we enter into some of the more controversial studies that we're going to discuss this chapter. The first of these is a surprisingly recent study done in 1995 by J. Philippe Rushton. Rushton conducted an extensive study measuring 60 different variables ranging from intelligence to brain size to all sorts of different social and physical measures related to mental ability. And across all of these measures, he reported that individuals of East Asian descent scored highest, those of African descent scored lowest, and Caucasians fell in the middle. As you can imagine, the publication of this research caused an immediate flurry of debate, political outrage, all sorts of chaos. There was a legal investigation looking into Rushton's research, as well as a human rights investigation to make sure that he wasn't violating human rights by publishing this research. And even to this day, there isn't a consensus within the field as to whether or not he should have conducted this kind of research. Some will argue that he was simply measuring different measures of intelligence and publishing what he discovered, whereas others pointed to it and said that this was a concrete way for people to start basing their biases against different groups. Now this study isn't the only of its kind. It wasn't the first and it won't be the last, but it does remind us that measures like this are being done and reported and there is an ongoing debate as to what the value of this kind of research is. Whether we agree with this kind of research or not, there are a couple of basic points that we can take from these types of studies. The first is that there are average group differences. Consistently across multiple studies looking at this, there are differences in how different groups score on certain tasks, things like IQ tests, where certain countries will tend to score much higher than individuals in other countries. So we do consistently see these average group differences. The thing to keep in mind though is that this isn't as clean cut as it sounds when these reports are shared in common media. So some reports will say that group A scores very low, and group B scores very high, and group C scores somewhere in the middle. And we see them as, you know, one is better than the other, or one is worse than the other. But that's not what we're going to take from this. We have a great overlap in IQ distributions. We've already looked at the bell curve of intelligence. And so in each of these, we'll see these curves. And so these studies aren't saying that all people in group B are always better than group C. Um, it's just saying that the average tends to fall above. Um, and this is a lot more spread out because it's easier to draw that way, but you're usually looking at things 
that are much more confused and close together and complicated, where there's lots of overlap in here, where you can have A, B, and C all on top of each other. So don't take these reports as uh, a definitive one group is better than the other, but take it as more of a uh, confused overlap of what exists. The next thing that we really need to consider is the fact that a lot of measures of intelligence are going to be biased. We started off this chapter by talking about how difficult it is to define intelligence and that intelligence means different things to different cultures and different groups. So how do we know that a measure of intelligence in one country is equivalent to a measure of intelligence in another? And how can we be sure that any of these studies that we're talking about are using a measure of intelligence that works across all cultures? That's the kind of critical thinking that's really important in this chapter. So we're going to talk about two major ways that we can see bias in experiments like these. The first of these types of bias is called outcome bias. Outcome bias is looking at how much a test underestimates a person's true intellectual ability. So if we have an IQ test, an outcome bias would be saying, well, how poorly or how much are we underestimating an individual's IQ based on this test? A test with no outcome bias would have a very good representation of an individual's actual IQ. But in a lot of cases, we run into things that are um, biased in terms of outcome, where maybe someone's actual IQ is higher than what they would score on a standard IQ test. Our second kind of bias to talk about is called predictive bias. And this is dealing with whether a test can predict outcome measures for some groups and not others. These outcome measures being things like um, success in school or in work. So a test that has predictive bias may be very good at predicting someone's success in a particular job environment if they are part of one group, but it might be less reliable for another group. This kind of predictive bias then might lead individuals using that test to hire one group over another group just based on the outcome measures that are produced. So what do we actually see in practice? How do we view these tests in terms of outcome and predictive biases? With our outcome bias, we do see that a lot of tests have different groups obtaining different scores. But it's kind of difficult to evaluate whether this test is a good evaluation of someone's intellectual ability because the test is the measure of intellectual ability so we don't necessarily have much to compare it to so that's troublesome in and of itself we do see uh, one example that we can talk about of outcome bias especially for canadians if a Canadian student has their IQ evaluated using the WACE 4, the most recent version of that WACE test, um, they can have two different IQ scores generated, depending on which norms are used to grade that test. So if they use the Canadian standard, the students are going to score lower in terms of IQ, whereas if they use the American norms, then that student would end up at the end with a higher IQ, despite having answered the test questions exactly the same way. And this causes extra problems because in Canada, people can use either the Canadian or American standards. So right off the bat, within Canadian scores, we have this problem with outcome bias where scores may be higher or lower just based on whether the Canadian or American standard was used. 
And there are also lots of ways where tests can show predictive bias, where they don't necessarily equally predict the success of individuals from different groups in how they will perform in either school or job performance. Um, but again, this is a very controversial topic, and some people will argue that outcome bias isn't a significant influence, or that predictive bias isn't actually a thing. So there's lots going on there, and as you start reading into the literature on outcome bias and predictive bias, the waters are fairly muddied. Um, and as per my usual uh, course of action, now that we've verbally described these things, I wanted to show a visual of where outcome and predictive bias would fall in the process of trying to determine if someone would succeed in a particular environment. So here we have someone's true mental ability, how intelligent someone is, or um, whatever measure we're using. And in order to actually obtain an IQ score, we have to go through some kind of testing process. And that test that's obtaining the IQ score may have an outcome bias, where if you are not accurately measuring true mental ability, the obtained IQ score is biased. If we then go to the second step, where you have this obtained IQ score, and we're going to try and evaluate what that means practically, in terms of how well someone will do in a professional environment, say a predicted criterion measure, if the conversion from this original IQ score to that predictive measure has a predictive bias, then this measure may not accurately determine if someone will succeed or not in that environment. So outcome bias would influence the earlier conversion from true ability to IQ score. Predictive bias comes into effect when we're going from that IQ score to some kind of predictive measure. Another thing to consider, even though the textbook doesn't spend a lot of time talking about this, is that the way that these IQ tests and other tests of mental ability are designed can make it so that certain groups do better than others, just based on what they've been exposed to before. If you have a test that was written by a bunch of white American men, then those questions are going to be framed in such a way that white American men will probably score a lot higher on that test than others. There's lots going on here in terms of potential for bias, and that's good to keep in mind as we move on. So let's talk about what factors might be underlying the differences between these different groups. One of the major discussion points is the debate between nature and nurture, which if you remember back to 104, is all about whether it's genetic or environmental. So to discuss this point of view, Researchers will tentatively accept the fact that, yes, there are potentially differences between groups. Now, what is it that's causing them? If we focus on the environmental side of things, let's consider academic environments. From lots of statistics looking at um, mostly North American areas, there are more opportunities for white children to attend enriching school environments. So when we're seeing differences between white students' performance and other groups, then maybe what we're seeing isn't necessarily um, a genetic predisposition to be smarter. Maybe what we're actually seeing is just an effect of the environment of having better schools and of being raised in more enriching environments. So if we break this down into a uh, genes and the environment example here, we can look at crops being grown in two different types of soil. So if we have 
seeds that are grown in very poor soil, barren soil. Um, barren soil here being the stand-in for a non-enriching school environment. If we see differences between plants all within that one type of soil, those differences are probably because of the genetic qualities of those seeds. So our within groups difference is caused by genetics. We can look at the other side of things where those same kinds of seeds planted in fertile soil, here the fertile soil being a stand-in for an enriching environment, we again can see differences between the seeds grown in those uh, good soils and the differences within that group will still be genetic. So in both cases, our within group differences should be caused by genetics. Because when you're looking within this group, within only fertile soil seeds, then there's no environmental difference. They're all grown in the same environment. But what we can also see is between group differences where Plants growing in barren soil are probably going to be shorter, less hardy, than plants grown in good soil. So the same way that children raised in non-enriching environments might show a lower IQ score than students who are growing up in a much more enriching environment. So when we're evaluating this nature versus nurture debate, we also have to consider the fact that we're not necessarily looking at the whole picture. It isn't just going to be differences in groups because of the groups themselves. There can also be environmental factors and there can be so many other things going on in the background. That's why we need to think critically about specifically these kinds of studies, but also about research in general because there's so much that's going on behind the scenes. Our next groups that tend to differ in their cognitive abilities that we're going to look at are the sexes. So we often see sex differences in cognitive abilities. Now most studies tend not to show a massive sex difference based on general intelligence. So the average IQ of men and women tends to be fairly similar, but we do see differences in their performance on certain types of intellectual tasks. So for example, we consistently see that females will perform better on tests of uh, perceptual speed, verbal fluency, mathematical calculation, and fine motor coordination. In contrast, males tend to perform better on te tests of spatial tasks, um, things like throwing and catching objects, and mathematical reasoning. So instead of calculations, they're better at the reasoning side of things. Now, again, we run into that um, consideration that even though we can see differences in performance between the sexes, and that these differences are consistently found across many, many studies in different parts of the world, this doesn't mean that all men are better at spatial tasks than all women. We still see that um, sort of the group averages look like this, and there's going to still be lots of overlap between the two groups. So we still see curves where um, the averages may be different, but there's lots of this messy overlap where they have similar performance. We also see from these uh, graphs here that there's lots of variability within the sexes. So some women are better at um, clean that off so I can go back. Um, some women are better at verbal fluency than others. Um, so there's, there's lots of variability going on here. Um, and I suppose I can show a visual that goes along with this to show what some of these tasks might be. So for a task that women tend to perform more quickly than men, if they were shown these four images and asked which one matches this lighter blue background card on the left, women would identify this as the correct answer a little bit faster than men, again, on average. Um, and for men outperforming women, they could do the same kind of task, but 
when they introduce this three-dimensional rotation side of things and they ask which of these is the same shape but in a different orientation, men tend to respond to those faster on average. And another aspect that the textbook doesn't quite go into but that's starting to become a lot more common to evaluate is not looking at sex differences in terms of a male-female dichotomy. More recent studies have investigated how individuals who are, say, uh, genetically male but identify as female may perform on these sorts of tasks. And that adds a new level of complexity, but it's a direction that the research is starting to take. So in the next few years, we should start looking at things on more of a continuum as opposed to a dichotomy of male or female. And if we want to talk about why these differences may exist, going back to just the textbook's discussion of male and female differences, there's a lot of, again, discussion on what might be driving this, where maybe it's um, biological structures. So back in the language section, we talked about the fact that women tend to have um, more of a diffused distribution of their language ability, um, where it's present on both the left and the right hemisphere of their brain, whereas men tend to have a more lateralized distribution, where the language center is almost exclusively on the left, again, on average. Um, so we might be seeing sex differences in uh, brain arrangement or physiological structures. It might also be due to hormones, where males and females tend to have different levels of different hormones in their bodies that might influence their performance on these tasks. So there's lots of different things to consider here that may underlie these sex differences. Um, and so in the future, as you get into classes that might get to spend more time on these topics, there's lots of interesting things to discuss here.